It confuses me as well. That's 102. I'm sorry, but I'm filming here. Yes, enjoy your trip. Bye bye. Hey everybody, it's Chris from Military Aviation History and I know what you're going to say. This is not an airplane. This is a floating target. And yes, you are correct. I'm on HMS Belfast. I've been invited here courtesy of Wargaming for the inauguration of their World of Warships gaming room on this very ship. So if you ever come down to HMS Belfast, why don't you check that out as well? Now it should be abundantly clear via a couple of things that I'm on a British floating target and not an American one. First off, of course, the name. Secondly, we have the strategically placed tower bridge just aft of the ship, as well as the Tower of London next to it, tourist magnets as well. And the other thing that should make it abundantly clear that this is a British ship is, well, this. Empty deck space. Yeah, if this was an American ship, at least somebody would have come along and bolted a couple of 50 cals or all guns of Bofors on here. But they haven't, because it's a British ship. No, of course I'm being unfair to HMS Belfast. HMS Belfast is actually a fantastic example of how the anti-aircraft suite and the anti-aircraft defenses of a World War II ship improved tremendously throughout the conflict. We're starting with an AA defense of this ship in 1939, when of course the war kicks off for Britain that is incredibly light. It is not up to the task it has to fulfill. And it has improved throughout the war until finally in 1945, after the German surrender, this ship is tasked to go to the Pacific. And there, of course, is the threat of kamikaze attacks. And at that point, this ship is upgraded with as many guns as she can bear against targets. And that's the story I want to tell to you today. Let's first go through the armament of HMS Belfast. As a town-class light cruiser, she's of course armed with 12 6-inch guns situated in four triple turrets. One of them is right here. Secondary armament of HMS Belfast consists out of six twin-mounted Mark 16 guns. Those are the 4-inch guns you see right there. 4-inch, if that confuses you, it confuses me as well. That's 102. I'm sorry, but I'm filming here. Yes, enjoy your trip. Bye-bye. Yes, the secondary armament, that is a four inch gun and that would be uh, Belfast dual purpose guns as well. Dual purpose, of course, means against surface targets as well as air targets. Beyond that, HMS Belfast also had torpedoes and depth charges, but they're no longer on the ship, so sadly I can't show you. Actually, there is one torpedo and it's found right here. So in 1939, HMS Belfast starts out the war with a comparatively light AA's defense suite. But she's not the only ship to have such weak defenses. In fact, it, through, before the war, it really wasn't a priority. But what we have on HMS Belfast, we have four mounts. The first one you find here, sort of on the aft tower structure, I'm sure some naval historian in the comments is going to tell me exactly what this area is called on the ship. But round about where you see the Bofors guns now would be the position of the two pounder, eight barrel AA mount. Now, Two pounders with eight barrels, that sounds impressive, it looks impressive. But that's really Belfast's only active defense if we ignore the four inch dual purpose guns against enemy aircraft. And that's not really going to be enough. Now, sure enough, if we go along the deck towards the hangar, on top of the hangar, we have the old position for the second set of AA guns. Again, one on either side. And this is a 50 cal. Well, a quad 50 cal, four 50 cal stacked on top of each other. Once again, sounds impressive, looks impressive, but really they don't have that stopping power and firepower that is required to deter even a semi-determined air attack at this point in the war. And as we will see, it simply wasn't enough and Belfast will upgrade her air defenses just like many other ships throughout the war. In 1942, the first changes are made to the anti-aircraft suite of this ship. First things first, the 50 cows are deleted, sorry America, but instead the engineers got cracking and started to refit this ship with 20 millimeter cannons. Five twin mounts and four single mounts, which was a hefty upgrade over what she had previously. I don't work here, but I'm just pretending. After the German surrender in May 1945, HMS Belfast is set to depart towards the Pacific and she has one more refit done to her, the Far East refit. And to tell us more about that, here's Rob Rumble, 
curator of HMS Belfast. So following the action during Normandy, uh, Belfast went in for refit again in order to fight in a completely different climate to the, the cold of the English Channel and the North Atlantic and the Arctic Ocean. Um, Belfast was to join the British Pacific Fleet um, fighting the Japanese and was to be refitted for the crew to work in the, the hot climate of the, of the Pacific Ocean. The ship had a new air conditioning system fitted as well as um, upgraded anti-aircraft systems and radar, radar systems as well. With that refit, Belfast sees the addition of a whole bunch of new guns that are to protect the aircraft of Japanese aviation in kamikaze attacks. Next to the guns that we've already mentioned, she gets four additional two-pounder in quad mounts, she gets four additional two-pounders in single mounts, as well as that she replaces the majority of her 20mm guns for five single mount Bofors guns of, of course, 40 millimeters. Now the Bofors you see right behind me there, those are not the guns we're talking about because those come from a later refit, more on that later. But it gives you sort of an idea, if you've been paying attention, how important it became for naval ships of the time to protect themselves against aircraft. In 1939, this ship starts out with four AA mounts. In 1945, it ends the war with 17. The ship departed for the Far East in July 1945, sailing through the Mediterranean, the Suez Canal, and on to uh, Colombo in Ceylon. Belfast um, then crossed the equator on its way to Australia. And it was during that uh, journey that the atomic bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki in Japan, causing eventually the surrender of the Japanese. Belfast's purpose then changed entirely from being a ship of war to fight the um, last desperate um, defences of the Japanese Navy to take the surrender of the Japanese forces across the uh, Southeast Asian region and to then more long term re-establish the territories of the British Empire which had uh, fallen to the Japanese during the Second World War. I'm standing in one of the six inch gun turrets of Belfast. This is the A turret, the one very much up front. And what we have here is of course a Mark 23 gun. 6 inch, 152 millimeters in metric, and this is not a dual purpose gun, meaning that it only engages surface targets rather than air targets. There's a couple of reasons for these uh, and why these guns really aren't meant or suited rather to the anti-aircraft rule. Let's go through them one by one. The first reason is the maximum elevation of these guns, 45 degrees, meaning that it's quite limited in tr trying to track and fire at high flying targets. It could theoretically, of course, fly, shoot at low flying targets, maybe an incoming torpedo bomber, um, but that really wouldn't be all that helpful either. The reload of this gun only happens at an elevation of a maximum of 12 and a half degrees, and usually it was lowered even more to facilitate easier loading by the crews talking about the loading, of course. That is another reason why this gun isn't really that useful in an anti-aircraft role. So we had the maximum elevation already, but as we're reloading the gun, the rounds come in via this chute, are placed into this uh, receiver, and they would place that shell into the gun. The whole ramming and breech mechanism is completely manual. Once that is done, they get the cordite charge from over here, take that out, place that in there, cordite charge roughly 30 pounds as well, and then uh, you close the action, you relay the gun on the target, and you fire. And there we go, Huck, as this gun is apparently called, has hopefully just scored a hit on an enemy surface vessel. But all of this process takes time, and this gun, or this turret, really only manages a fire rate of roughly eight rounds a minute, which isn't really, once again, that suited against fast movers like aircraft. The reason beyond that, of course, is Although HMS Belfast is supplied with HE rounds for her guns, a thousand rounds roughly, for the six inch guns, she is not supplied with time fuses. 
And the importance of time fuses will become important as we are starting to talk about the four inch guns. But before we do that, if you want to know how to use these guns against surface targets, well, you have information coming in from the director control that's on top of the bridge or on the aft tower. I believe it's called the aft tower. It's that structure in the back. And you have rangefinders there, and they, of course, are recording the, uh, the distance, the speed, the heading of the enemy surface target. And also, they're recording the splashes on it, so they can guide the gunners in as, as they fire in towards the enemy target uh, with those gun splashes. Beyond that, uh, the Hellfirst would be upgraded with a um, surface radar system, which would allow her to fire these guns in adverse weather conditions when you couldn't really see the enemy vessel that much or distances where it becomes a little bit problematic. Um, but again, these changes were not made in order to facilitate these guns firing against aircraft. It really was just an anti-surface vessel weapon uh, that Belfast had. And at the same time, of course, you could also do shore bombardments with it, for example, on the 6th of June, 1944 at D-Day. So Belfast was in the Pacific when the Cold War turned hot in June 1950 when the communist North Koreans invaded South Korea and, um, and Belfast joined the British Pacific Fleet as part of the wider United Nations fleet which went in to support United Nations and South Korean forces um, uh, first at the Pusan perimeter and then um, forcing back the North Koreans up the Korean Peninsula um, throughout 1950. The Korean War was Belfast's busiest period of service history. Um, uh, it fired more than 8,000 rounds from its six-inch guns and uh, over the uh, two years from 1950 to 1952 was um, at sea in action for a total of 404 days. Um, so much so in fact that the ship had to return to Singapore for refit and have its um, gun barrels replaced. They were, they were worn out. So um, Korea was um, one of the most significant uh, features of uh, certainly of Belfast's um, post Second World War history. Let's talk about those four inch guns then. And like I said, 102 millimeters. Now, sadly, we can't access them because HMS Belfast is doing something great. They are doing it for you. They are repainting the whole ship. They're getting it nice and shiny for when the visitors return. So this would also be the perfect opportunity to plan that visit, of course. Now, these were two purpose guns. Of course, surface targets could be attacked with them as well as air targets. Maximum elevation of these guns, 80 degrees, which means that anything that is not right above the ship can, of course, be fired at and with 20 rounds a minute they also fire a lot faster than the six inch guns up front and in the rear. The shell itself 50 pounds can be handled quite comfortably by a single person as well as that the cordite charge is already integrated in the shell so you don't have two steps in order to fire off the gun one single loading mechanism works and that's your job done essentially. Maximum range of these guns 19 kilometers you ain't gonna be effective at 19 kilometers especially against aircraft that's not possible but these guns would be the first ones to open up against aircraft coming in. Now HMS Belfast was supplied with roughly 2,000 rounds of HE ammunition for their quick firing 4 inch guns and these also had time fuses and what the time fuses allow is of course giving the shell a certain time period after which to explode. So let's say you have director control information coming in to the crews telling them how to lay their guns. You of course had the trainer to the right again and the layer to the left and they receive the information of where to train their gun base based on a receiver device that they have mounted in front of them. As they're training the gun, they're obviously not aiming for the plane as it is in that very moment. They're leading the target. That means that once they fire the gun, and let's say the shell has to travel five seconds in order to get that to that point of interception, it gets to that point of interception just as the aircraft passes into it, if it of, of course follows the sort of projected heading that you're getting from the director and firing control. And there's a lot of quick math involved here with the aircraft's altitude being measured, its speed, its heading, and so on and so forth. Belfast initially had to do this in a more manual approach. Later on, she also had uh, radar systems for uh, blind firing as well as for gathering information on the aircraft's heading speed and altitude. As that information is processed, it is being sent to the gunners. 
the gun crew then lays the gun and of course fires off the shell. But the shell itself is also being set by a nice little device, we'll just call it a fuse setting tray. And this is really something that pilots hated because you put the shell in there and it automatically, based on the information that it got from the firing control, changes the fuse to be at that optimal setting for leading the target and intercepting it on its trajectory. You put that round into the gun, you fire it, and hopefully it explodes within the vicinity of the enemy aircraft. Now a hundred millimeter shell has a destructive radius of roughly 10 meters around it. This time fuse was a device that was used by all participants in the war and for example German AA defenses with their 88 millimeter anti-aircraft guns would also be using the same thing. However, the Allies, they had an ace in their sleeve and that was the VT fuse. This comes in roughly 1943, a little bit later than that and it's the variable time fuse. Now what is the variable time fuse? In fact, it's not a timed fuse in the sense that we just talked about with the early AHE rounds. It's actually a code word. What it is 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 a proximity fuse. In layman terms, you shoot this round off and it starts to sense an enemy aircraft. Essentially what it has, does, it sends out the signal and with the Doppler effect of the returning signal, it can then, as it gets closer to the enemy, uh, enemy plane, it realizes that the signal is being received just as fast as it is being transmitted, which means that it's incredibly close to that target and then it explodes. And that takes one factor of error out of the whole equation, since you don't no longer rely on that time fuse, but you can rely on a fuse that knows exactly when to go off. And this really was, in a way, a secret weapon that the Allies had. Now the British, they of course came up with that idea, they then transferred it to the Americans, the Americans made it to work and then supplied the rest of the Allies with it. And interesting fact as well, London's AA defense during the war at the later stages during the war were also supplied with these proximity fuses in order to deter German raiders coming in as well as German V1 buzz bombs. So this really was a game changer and if you're more interested in the VT fuse check out this earlier video that I've done on that fuse as well. Coming then to the final piece in the puzzle, we have the 40mm Bofors guns. Now, this is probably the most effective mid-caliber anti-aircraft gun that existed during World War II. It was used by all sides, but especially the Allies, and especially, of course, the US Navy, but also the Royal Navy. The guns that you're seeing right here are actually from the 1959 refit, so they're a little bit more modern than they would have looked like in those single mounts during World War II, but quintessentially the same gun. We, of course, have the trainer on the right hand side, he traverses the gun, we have the layer on the left hand side, he elevates the gun and both of them have a spider sight here in order to keep that aircraft in their sight and while firing it is and in later versions they would also be getting firing control uh, solutions from, uh, from the firing control system. The easiest job on this gun as you is presented right here would be for the layer and it's also the most fun job because he's the one that's actually flying the gun. The trainer here uses his muscle power in order to traverse the gun, the layer over there has an electric drive helping him elevate it. At the same time, he has a foot battle with the kit he depress and the gun would go off. When the gun goes off, it fires, well, uh, roughly 120 rounds per minute and it of course has to be kept supplied with rounds coming in. We have ready racks over here. Mind you, of course, this gun again refits, so this wouldn't have looked like it in World War II. But we have these ready racks and of course these containers, these lockers to the side where the ammunition would be stored and then fed into these ready racks as the loaders would be taking them and placing them into their shot guides. During World War II, look at some pictures on Google for example from these gun positions on US naval ships, on Royal Navy ships and you'll see a lot of ready racks all around the gun position as of course the loaders as these guns were firing had to keep up that steady rate of fire and just continuously add more ammunition to them. So in order to resupply the gun, the loader of course has these four round clips. They look a little bit like stripper clips on some of the World War II rifles that you might know and modern rifles as well. He takes that clip and he just lets it slide into the shot guides of the bow force. Now a word to the perhaps uninitiated like I once was. This reloading sequence is incredibly simple. 
and it happens almost automatically. As, as soon as you have the clip in the shot guides, it just falls in nicely. So if you ever get to handle dummy rounds with a deactivated gun, be very, very cautious and don't have them stuck in there because it's a nightmare to get them out. I'm speaking from experience. Uh, but yeah, that was how you kept up that uh, steady rate of fire that you of course had to keep up because a 40 millimeter is both force had a good stopping power against an aircraft. A single hit, two hits, three hits, definitely the aircraft is done for. But you need to score those hits, of course, and for that you need that volume of fire. And with this gun, you could have it, but you had to keep it resupplied at all times. And that is why essentially the teamwork between the trainer, the layer, and the loaders in order to keep that steady upward fire, as well as the director control information that is being fed to these guns, depending on what version they were, uh, is crucial in really stopping aircraft attacking a, a ship like HMS Belfast, especially if they're coming cards of planes in the Pacific. So at this point, we get to the story where it's for me as an aviation historian gets a little bit sad, right? HMS Belfast, when she comes out, she has two aircraft that are residing in hangars. I'm actually standing on one of the hangars right now. And there would be, of course, a mirrored hangar on the other side of the deck on the port side. This was deleted at some point during one of the refits in order to allow more men, material and equipment to be stored on this ship. But you still see a couple of artifacts. First of all, on deck you can still see some of the rails that were used in order to guide the plane in and out. And then of course we have the crane here uh, that would be used to hoist the Supermarine Walrus that would be used on HMS Belfast. Of course, with folded wings in the hangar, rolled out, hoist that onto the water. Once it's on the water, you deploy the wings and off you go. Now, these Supermarine Walruses were used for a variety of roles. Um, reconnaissance, spotting, leaves and duties, even light transport duties between faraway ships or between this ship and a port. Once the plane lands again, it, is, it folds its wing, it is folded back, then also onto board HMS Belfast by the clever use of, well, this very crane. There's not much that really reminds us of the use of Supermarine Walruses on Belfast, but we still have that crane, we still have some of the artifacts on deck, and it's just a neat part of, of course, the history of this ship, because even though I'm sad that those Supermarine Walruses aren't used or stored anymore on the ship. It is of course also testament to sometimes the requirements for a ship change. And this was one of the ways to meet those requirements because yeah, at some point those planes were just not needed anymore. Following the armistice that um, ended the Korean War in 1953, Belfast had become in some ways surplus to requirements in, in, in the Royal Navy. The, the, uh, the fleet was being scaled back. And, uh, and Britain and the Royal Navy was finding its place in, in, in the new, in the new uh, world, as it were. The Soviet Navy was expanding. Um, new cruisers, such as the Svedlov class, were seen as a, as a threat to, to British and NATO naval superiority. And Belfast was, it was decided to refit um, and rebuild Belfast for the, uh, for the nuclear age. The ship was refitted from 1956 to 1959 um, and fitted out with the latest um, technology. Much of the open decks was uh, enclosed in and encased so that the, the ship could um, fight under nuclear, chemical and biological conditions um, with new air conditioning to um, provide a uh, enclosed uh, vacuum for the crew to survive those conditions. A new superstructure forward of the ship was built and um, a, a new sort of consistent uh, system of both as anti-aircrafts guns were, were fitted at the time as well along with all the corresponding radar systems and electronic warfare systems which were now encased in two new latticework masts built at the centre of the ship between the funnels. I want to thank HMS Belfast for allowing us to film here today. If you're looking for something to do in London, if you're coming to visit, if it's safe for you to visit, do check out HMS Belfast. She's a fantastic ship to visit and to experience the story and history of this. This vessel is just absolutely magnificent. I also want to thank Drache Niffel for the many chats we had about HMS Belfast's history and of course uh, Wargaming for inviting me to today's World of Warship event. If you're looking to experience naval combat from World War I, World War II and even the post-World War II era, check out World of Warships. Many exciting battles await you and it's completely free with the link in the description below. As always, I wish all of you a great day 
and see you in the sky. Or on the ocean, I guess. <laughs>